Hi and welcome to another Roaring Stories online author event. I'm Sunil Badami here at Balmain's Royal Oak Hotel and on Facebook Live. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this land, the Eora people, of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and future and acknowledge the knowledge embedded forever within Aboriginal custodianship of this land. We'll have time for questions later, so um, please make sure, if you are on Facebook Live, to post your questions in the comments now and during the session, and I'll read them out for you. If you're in the room, please make sure you've got your phones on silence. You're welcome to take photos, but please don't use a flash. Turn your flash off and share your thoughts and pictures about tonight on our Insta, Twitter and Facebook accounts. That's Roaring Stories, at Roaring Stories, or on Facebook, Roaring Stories 268 with the hashtag Roaring Stories. And if you like, hashtag Stalin's Wine Cellar. Should leave you about 75 characters to put in some pity thoughts as well. <laughs> Now, thanks to our great friends at Balmain's own Field Blend Wine and Cheese Store, Roaring Stories is giving away a gift hamper of wines, including two Georgian wines to help you relive the experience. <laughs> Without the guns of John's journey into Georgia. It's valued at over $150, and you can go into the running <coughs> to win this amazing prize. All you've got to do is buy a copy of the book before Sunday the 6th of September. Now, what day is that? Yes, that's right, it's Father's Day. So if you haven't got something for the old man yet, now's the time to do it. There's also a link on our FB Live event page. And if you buy on the Roaring Stories website at roaringstories.com.au or the FB Live page and you buy now, you will get a signed copy from John and if you live in Balmain or surrounding suburbs, you'll get your postage for free, as well as going into the running for this wonderful prize. And the more copies you buy for you and your dad, <laughs> the better your chance of winning the hamper. Well, after stints as a hotelier and a rock and roll promoter in the 1980s, John Baker founded a number of fine wine stores, including Quaffers, Double Bay, um, and Cellars, and the Newport Bottler becoming well known among the winerati as a purveyor of quality, rare and antique wines. In the late 1990s, he was approached by a colourful business identity with a mysterious wine list that seemed to be the comprehensive catalogue of the fabulous wine collection of Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, which secreted to a remote Georgian winery at the height of World War II by the dictator Joseph Stalin. John and Kevin Hopko, his colleague with an encyclopedic knowledge of antique wine and an eye for a brilliant deal, embarked on an audacious and incredible journey, plunging into the depths of a cavernous cellar in the chaos of the post-Soviet Republic of Georgia to discover if the wines were authentic and if the collection could be sold for what promised to be the biggest wine auction ever in history. So from Double Bay to Sibilacy, via the streets of Paris and the vineyards of Bordeaux, featuring a cast of characters including Tsar Nicholas II, Hitler, Stalin, and a motley crew of shady gun-toting double dealers, Stalin's wine cellar is a wild and sometimes terrifying ride into the glamorous and shady world of antique wine, where wines and bottles can go for hundreds of thousands of dollars. The novelist Ford Maddox Ford once said that the only duty of wine is to be read. <laughs> <laughs> and with Stalin's wine cellar, John Baker and his co-author, Nick Pace, may have just done that with this book. Welcome, John. Thank you, Sunil. Pleasure to be here. Now, how <clears throat> did you become interested in wine? Um, I think it was probably a function of growing up, actually, in that I was a hotelier, as you mentioned, and I had a hotel that was part of the um, Sydney rock and roll circuit in the 80s, uh, which was fantastic fun. Um, you know, we'd have Cold Chisel or Men at Work playing, or a lot of these bands, and they were fantastic nights. But I think uh, the telling type point was I arrived home one night about three or four in the morning, smelling halfway between a brewery and a cigarette factory. And I thought, I'm not sure if this is how I want to spend the rest of my life doing this. Uh, so um, I saw, and also at the time, um, Breathalyzer came in, 
which of course was a good thing, but it killed the pub rock and roll because it was basically in the suburbs. Uh, there's a little bit in the city, but it was a string of hotels around the suburbs. Um, so that killed pub rock and roll. We then um, uh, created a, a comedy store at our hotel. I think up till then the only comedy was in the city at the comedy store and we so we started at, at, at Dural where we had you know, Vince Sorrenti and Rodney Roode and Anthony Aykroyd and Ostentatious and all those comedians and that went well but I was tiring of this but I quite liked those bottles of wine that I didn't actually know a great deal about at the time. I knew a little bit about them. So I sold the hotel and <clears throat> bought my first wine store uh, and went from there. What makes <clears throat> wine or a wine special? Hmm, how long have you got? <laughs> About 45 minutes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I think um, a wine that's special is, wine is a, um, quality wine is a pursuit of excellence, where the winemaker or the vineyard has taken what nature has provided and, and turned it into a wine. But you can't bully grapes to make it become a great wine. It is very much a coaxing, nurturing, scientific, sensitive process to make a great wine or very good or great wine um, so yeah but but then there's two there's different two sides of wine this is one of my favorite ones that um, if you all you're interested in is smell and taste don't spend more than ten dollars because for ten dollars you get a lot of smell and taste if you're not interested in uh, the subtlety of the wine or the mouth feel or the length of the of the palate or where it's come from or the terroir it's grown then don't pay for it and if you're not interested in those, just spend ten dollars. Um, you get tons of taste for ten dollars. So, yeah. how much do you usually spend on a bottle of wine? Uh, I actually don't actually drink much these days, but I drink half bottles, and I get them from wholesalers. But I'll pay uh, twenty or thirty dollars for a half bottle wholesale, and they can be delicious. Um, and that one of the other things I or I've learnt, and I believe that if you drink better quality wine, you tend not to not to slurp it and, and, and glug it. You're, because it's interesting, you'll sip it and maybe smell it and think about it, and that way you actually drink less. The trouble is it costs you more to drink that sort of wine. <laughs> but in the end, because you're drinking less volume, probably balances out. Well, speaking of that sort of wine, I mean, Chateau de Chem is considered to be the hallmark, the great white whale of the wine world, with bottles going for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why is Chateau de Chem so special? Uh, okay, Chateau de Chem is a dessert wine, a sweet wine. Uh, it is the pinnacle of Sauternes, the region of Bordeaux, which makes the great white wines of certainly of Bordeaux, some probably of the world, although it's, these things are always debatable. And whether it's the great wine of the world, that's debatable, but it's certainly one of the greats and has been for a long time. Uh, it's just extraordinary, complex, rich, deep wine that um, fascinates people and when they pick a chem, when they're picking grapes as you may or may not know, they usually go along with, if it's hand picked they'll clip a bunch and clip a bunch and that's how they pick it. When they go along with a chem they pick it by the berry and they will go through the vineyard six to ten times picking berries that, 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 that are just right to, pick, to make a chem. So it's a very painstaking, uh, difficult process uh, of very low yield, obviously high cost in labour, but they produce this wine that no one always, no one's ever been able to match. Even the vineyards surrounding it, Rear Sec, Sudero, uh, other ones, you know, neighbouring it. And a chem does have the highest position in Sauterne, uh, but they can't make a wine like a chem. And so what's it like opening a bottle of wine like Chateau de Kim. I mean, you know, we associate wine with pleasure, but do you ever feel sad? Or did you ever feel sad to open, you know, a kind of one-of-a-kind wine, like, say, an 1847 Chateau de Kim, knowing that there was one less bottle of it in the world? <laughs> I, I've never opened an 1847 Chateau No, we'll get to that in a <laughs> Unfortunately. second. Unfortunately. Um, no, because the great wines, um, uh, the great wines, it's about knowledge, it's about knowing, just tasting it and knowing what, that vi what this nature provided for that vintage and how the winemakers turn it out and how good is the wine or how disappointing is the wine. So the great wine is about knowledge. The bottle's not worth anything. It's only the knowledge of, of what they've created that really is worth anything. 
Now, you mentioned in the book that there are wines to have as investments and there are wines to enjoy. What makes a wine an investment and one a wine to enjoy? Um, probably a difficult one. Um, an investment one is one you bought well enough, <laughs> I suppose. No, um, there's certain wines that sell very well that you may not prefer. I mean, Penfolds Grange, for example, our iconic wine. Now, it's not everybody's cup of tea, as no wine is, but um, it trades well. I mean, there are people who actually run a business just, with, on, a, just on Grange. They buy and sell the, a Grange and they trade it, etc., and, et and they find some inexpensive bottles or cases in England and they ship it back to Australia because the price in Australia is, you know, doing a, you know, is, is higher than the price in, in the UK or, you know, there's all sorts of... But there's people that actually run a small business just trading in uh, Penfolds Grange. I mean, what's interesting is for many of us would never have, haven't tasted a Grange and wouldn't necessarily know what a Grange is meant to taste like. And especially with some of the wines, the antique wines that you were dealing in, in or dealing with in Starlin's mm. Wine Cellar, <clears throat> like a Chateau, 1847 Chateau de Chem, I mean, there wouldn't be elaborate tasting notes like we would expect today. So I, I'm thinking, for example, about Benjamin Walsh's 2014 book, The Billionaire's mm -hmm. Vinegar, which yeah. told a story of a fabled 1787 Chateau Lafitte Bordeaux, which was supposedly owned by Thomas Jefferson and which sold at the time for $156,000 for auction. But how can you tell that the wine you're looking at, much less tasting, is genuine, given that there may not be that kind of provenance or tasting notes? Well, in that case, it wasn't genuine. Um, it was a fake. And um, yeah, sure. No one really, no one really knows what these wines are meant to taste like. Except, I mean, in the book we talk about the 1899 Sudero Chateau Sudero, one of the great Saturns, which Ravaz, our cellar master, managed to drop. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. We might get to that. Um, and we managed to retrieve it, and uh, and we got to taste it. Um, and <clears throat> I'd never tasted a 100-year-old Chateau Sudero. But I tasted quite a bit of Sudra and it is a Saturn that I particularly like and I know its style. So when I got to this, when we got to this 100 year old one and got to taste it, I don't really know what an 89 ounce Sudra tasted like, but it certainly would taste something like this. And it had a fineness and elegance, a finesse about it, which is Sudra's hallmark. I mean, we say not to judge a book by a cover, even one with a cover as beautiful as this. <laughs> but is there an element of being, I guess, led? By the label? Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Oh, you know, everyone in the wine industry is prejudiced for and against. Um, and the label talks volumes. Um, the label of Chateau Akem, for example, you don't have to put the bottle on the table, you could probably put tea in it and you're going to go, oh wow, this is amazing. Do you know what? <laughs> I actually have, this is a true story, I once went to a very posh wedding and they had bottles of blue label Johnny Walker on the table, right, which I naturally drank. And I refill it with Dewar's. And every time I pour it for a guest, <laughs> they tell me that's why you pay for it. That's the quality. I don't know if there's any dregs of blue label in the bottom. I <laughs> oh, no, the label it talks volumes, especially if you know the wines. Um, and they mean something to you. you know, you'll serve a, a certain wine in front of people who really know wine. And, you know, someone will be going, oh, wow, look at what we've got. This is amazing. You know, it's all about the label. The wine might be really disappointing. It could be corked, as, some, as sometimes they are. Um, yeah, so what you... S now, you mentioned you've never actually opened a bottle of Chateau de Chem. <coughs> um, what's it like dropping a bottle of Chateau de Chem on 1954 <laughs> Grange Hermitage? And a special tip for those of us who've been in that situation, not necessarily with a $147,000 bottle of wine, but maybe something with a lot more flavour and smell. Um, <laughs> how do you rescue the wine from a broken bottle? OK. <laughs> um, sometimes you have accidents that smile on you. This one did, actually. But we had this... Um, when we left uh, Georgia, one of our goals of being there, we're only there on a reconnaissance mission just to see if this cellar was genuine, if the wines were genuine. You know, it was 40,000 bottles, so we certainly weren't going to be moving any while we were there. But we negotiated and they'd agreed that we could take 12 bottles with us. So we wanted to take 12 bottles, selected bottles by us, 
to the various chateaus, like take a bottle of Chateau Akem to Akem and say, you know, is this your wine? Uh, I mean, I didn't need any, after all the investigations we did while we were there, of um, you know, cor the corks are stamped, and so with the date and the names, and capsules are certain, the glass is a, is a certain style of that period. Um, but I didn't, need, I didn't need anyone to tell me that it looks like a bottle of a chem. I, I needed the chem winemaker to taste it and say, this is definitely a chem, because there was 217 bottles from the 1980s and to the early, 1990, the early 1990s. Uh, yeah. Um, and that was half the value of the seller. We valued the Akem alone at four to five million dollars. So I had to know that what was in the bottle was the genuine article. So we had one of the bottles we uh, took out of um, Georgia or Tbilisi was an eight, 1870. And the bottles we took, we'd selected. So I didn't want them interfering, giving us anything that might not have been quite, because I was, I was susceptible of, oh, I was careful of this the whole time I was there, that. You know, this could be a fraud. The whole thing was a fraud. More, mind you, the more we spent there, it just looked less like it. But anyway, um, so one of the bottles we took out was an 1870 Akem, and the idea was to take it to the chateau. And I knew Pierre Leton, the CEO of Akem, uh, and a friend of mine in Bordeaux organised uh, an audience with them. And the chief winemaker at Akem is Sandrine Gabay, a young lady, she was at the time, I think in her mid 30s, but. Very, most competent in the work. But we'd had a big dinner in, in London the night before and um, with some wine friends and I think we had a seven o'clock flight or something out of, out of um, Heathrow to Paris and when we're packing up, you know, life wasn't exactly balanced, <laughs> shall we say, and we're packing up everything and being very careful, as, you know, as careful as you can, drinking coffee and et cetera. And anyway, so we got Got to Heathrow, got on the plane, got to Charles de Gaulle, got to our hotel and all had all these bags. And, and Jane, my partner, I, I said to her, um, and it's not her fault at all, but I said, um, just make sure you keep that wine bag on your shoulder or keep a hold of that. I'll look after all, all the other bags. Anyway, as happens, uh, the staff at the hotel were grabbing bags and, and all the bags happening and everything was all a bit messy. And there's a narrow footpath on these funny little hotels with a not a, exactly a perfect footpath. And suddenly one, one, I think two of the bags, one of the bags just dro dropped over. And I sort of saw it fall and I thought, it is the wine bag. So I raced over, grabbed it, just in case. I didn't think anything would be wrong, but the chem had broken. And How did you feel at that moment? Terrible. <laughs> I, was, I, th I wish I could have had a heart attack just to get out of there. <laughs> But it, it, it cracked just across the bottom. And this would be, you know, um, old glass and probably not most perfect glass. But I had it also in a, a material like a wetsuit sleeve to hold it all together. And that was part of its protection, supposedly. And I realised, so I quickly opened it and, it was, and I, I saw it was coming from the bottom. So I grabbed the a cam and quickly turned it upside down. So, and hardly and the bottom, bottom was still affixed to the bottle, although it was cracked. So we didn't lose a lot of the liquid. And the important thing in my hurried mind was that a chem tasted the liquid. And we've sort of done this with broken bottles maybe once or twice before. But, mm -hmm. um, so I raced off and grabbed two little Perrier bottles uh, because they had little screw caps, raced back, took the water out, poured the chem into the Perrier bottles, a little bit overflow so you can screw the cap on with no air. So at least I had the I had the liquid, I had the bottle. I think there's a picture in the book of actually had the, had the bottle, the neck of the bottle still had the capsule, still had the cork, which are, and so we had all the parts intact, except they weren't together. <laughs> it was a little bit of a problem. So um, anyway, anyway, then we and we you just asked me what did it taste like? Was that correct? Yeah. No, I but, want to know. Now you've told me, but how to recover <laughs> wine from a broken bottle? I mean, it's the least nerve-wracking moment in the book. Um, we often think of wine as being very staid, very perche, very bougie. But it seems, at least from your book, that it seems to attract a fair share of, I guess you could say, colourful characters, including Harry, the guy who first gave you the list that led you to Georgia. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Uh, well, it's alcohol. 
So, um, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> there's a certain indulgence there and an overindulgence and you know, people can get talkative and communicative and loud, etc. So also I don't think it's got that much to do with it. It's also can be a very high value, so it becomes a collectible and therefore fakes and forgeries are kick in at a certain price, as they do in all collectibles. Um, and also, I guess it's one of those products that you can't quite put your finger on. In, the, in what I said before, it's you know taking something from nature, turning it into a consumer product. And you can't put your finger quite put your finger on why it's why they've got it exactly right or almost exactly right. Why does, does that a crack colourful character? I don't know. Um, it just seems to. So, how did you discover Stalin's wine cellar? Well, um, when I was in. Uh, running wine stores and particularly this shop in Double Bay, we're always looking for a point of difference. We're a retail shop, same as everybody else, more or less, and I always believed you have to have a point of difference somehow. And so we uh, specialised in buying private sellers. And with our location, we, we could sell that sort of wine. And because we dealt in that sort of wine, a lot of people would come along and say, oh, look, you know, I've got a case of such and such Grange, or I've got a case of Lafitte Rothschild, you know, we'd, would you like to buy it? And we'd sort of say, how much? And often we'd, we'd possibly buy it, we possibly would Harry Zucker, our colourful character in the book, um, he was a character who'd been in the wine industry, had been in retail, and he was a member of a lot of these um, wine clubs and beef take steak and burgundy clubs and all this sort of thing. And Harry, and I was quite happy to, um, you know, reward Harry for finding me sellers, shall we say. And um, so Harry would, Find, find sellers. He'd come in and he was a very excitable chap. He'd sort of come in and say, John, 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 I got this fantastic, I got this fantastic seller. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah, Harry, OK, what have you got, what have you got? And he'd tell me, and sometimes it was, I think it was, he must have been bored or something, obviously a figure of his imagination, but occasionally brought in some very handy sellers. And like the one we talk about in the book that we bought in um, Beacon Hill that had two full sets of Grange and I think it was five cases of 1966 Lafitte Rothschild, and it was like extraordinary. Um, so some of these characters you can't dismiss them because you know they they do know they do know what they they're doing. It's sometimes they get a bit overexcited. Yeah, I know, but it's you know you get a mysterious list with a strange code and unrecognisable words, and Harry very excited about it, and he's got a mate called Neville who's also involved somehow <laughs> in the Georgian mining industry. Yeah, I'm starting to hear. Hello, dear friend. I'm a Nigerian prince. Can you please deposit a <laughs> hundred grand? How, was there any every point where you kind of thought, what convinced you to take the leap and a 30-hour flight to an obscure post-Soviet republic? OK. Um, <clears throat> when we finally worked out what the wine was, and the wine was a 30-page fax, and the Harry's cover page, all it said was interested question mark. And when, he, when ha Harry uh, I, just says interested and that's all. In other words, underplays it. You know, he's really got, he thinks he thinks he's really got something. <laughs> and he was always a part of the deal. You know, he'd be paid on a commission basis, or we might include him somehow. So you know, he was got very excited about being involved. And and um, so this list came through, and it was we finally worked out what it was. Was all these French wines? Someone, well, we happened to be in Georgia. Someone had recorded. Someone had called out the names of the wines, like Chateau Margaux. And someone had recorded it in Georgian, and there's actually a picture of the book in uh, the cellar uh, book in, in there. And Georgian, of course, is nothing like English. And then um, <clears throat> there was a change of ownership in the winery about '96, I think. So the Berlin Wall came down '89. Georgia became independent country '92 or '93, I think. And then there's a slight change of ownership in the in uh, Savannah Number One Winery. And I think what had happened is someone said, oh, well, why don't we try and sell all that wine downstairs because we need money, as Georgia did. So then someone had translated the list from Georgian back to English. So you end up with this phonetic list. And a, a, a Chateau Akem, for example, which is spelt small d apostrophe capital Y Q U E M, Akem, D is silent, Akem, was, was spelt on the list I K E M, like Ikea. So when I looked at the list, it's got Ikea, you know, Ikea, Ikea 1856, Ikea 1847, Ikea 1911, Ikea. I'm going, well, 
I, I don't want anything from IKEA. And I couldn't, I couldn't get IKEA. I, anyway, but I wasn't going to give up on this because I sort of, I mean, I've, it's taken us 20 years to write the story, so, so I don't give up easily. Um, and eventually the penny dropped. A chap came in and said something to me about a chem, and, I, and it clicked that this was a phonetic. And when I went back, if you, tra if you, tra if you apply a phonetic spelling or phonetic interpretation, the list starts really meaning something. So why did we go? How could you not? Um, this is our business. Um, at worst, it was going to be an amazing adventure trip. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure that at worst it would be an amazing adventure. <laughs> like maybe adventure would be up there as icing on the cake. But how did you prepare for it? Well, we'd, we'd been buying cellars in Australia, um, so we just really prepared the same way. We had, to, we had a list, so when we buy a cellar, we have a list and we negotiate the price on the list. And then when you actually move the cellar, there's always unders and overs. So you end up with one more bottle of something and one less bottle of something else, and you adjust the final price that way. And it's, it always works out. And you've got to consider where you're going and what you need. So to go to Georgia, was a, sure, it was a different story. We saw some photographs of the cellar, which looked quite dark. Uh, so we took some special lights, some big fluoros to light up. We took some torches, because we knew we... One of the ways you tell an old wine um, is, to, as I was saying, a lot of the corks are stamped. And so you have to scrape a little bit of the capsule off and shine a very strong light on the cork so you could see what's written there. So we had to take a good strong cork, we had to take spare batteries, and we had to take a roll of US dollars because <laughs> <laughs> I knew at some stage someone was going to want some US dollars for something. Uh, so we obviously took some cash and um, we took our polystyrene box to take to bring, actually we took to bring our tour bottles home. Actually, we took polystyrene, polystyrene boxes to bring 24 bottles home, but we didn't get away with 24. <laughs> but we got away with 12. So we took that. Um, I can't remember what else. Cameras. Yeah. But we. Yeah, and we, who did you arrange your travel to Georgia with? Did you have a fixer on the ground? Did no, no, we just Harry had, help you or Neville? No, no, no. I took a travel agent because you know I've been going to Europe quite a bit on buying, buying for stores and things like that. So. We just had to arrive in Tbilisi, and and George and his his colleagues <laughs> would take care of the rest. So tell us a little bit about George. What's his story? George. Uh, well, George was. Uh, so how this happened? You mentioned Neville, who had the, had the list in the first place. Neville was involved in the gold mine in Tbilisi, or in Georgia, sorry. And George was his partner. George from Georgia, and George was. Um, one of these slightly rotund, um, loose limbed, devil may care character. And if you know many Europe, Eastern Europeans, they can be that sort of character. Very likeable. Um, would give you anything and maybe take it back with the other hand sort of thing. Um, but very likeable. You know, and he, he wanted to sell this wine. Uh, I think what I'd worked out that he was probably trying to find a buyer before he, sorry, a, a buyer before he'd bought it. Uh, because we weren't exactly sure who owned this wine the whole time we were there negotiating, but he certainly held sway. He, um, the, the, the executives at the winery, the two of them, the chief winemaker and the sort of general manager, I think you call him, you know, they were in charge to a degree, but George certainly um, had sway there uh, and did a lot of the talking. Um, so, yeah, so George was this character, but George would often go missing. And George had this fairly flexible idea of time. And George, you're going to be here at 9 o'clock. Yeah, of course, you know, no problem, I'll follow my friend. And of course, 10 o'clock comes, George is not here. And then when he does turn up, he, he does what he has to do, and he's got to, he's got to go for a minute. <laughs> so he's, this is sort of happening. But that was OK, because all we want to do is be underground in the cellar just going through the cellar bottle by bottle. We didn't want George or anyone else there, really. So what was Tbilisi like and, and, and Georgia in general? Um, interesting, but I'm probably not the right person to ask because I get fairly single-minded when I'm doing something like this and all I really wanted to be was underground inspecting bottles. <clears throat> the rest was a distraction. But Kevin was observant. He, actually, Kevin kept a diary when we were there, so he had some quite good notes and you know things like food we ate and um, <clears throat> other things and 
So, um, and then when we were writing, when Nick was writing the book, or <coughs> he was taking my notes and my manuscripts, and he elaborate, he investigated a lot of um, the places we'd been that we had notes of, but we didn't actually know much about. So, <coughs> excuse me, he did a lot of research on on this. So, some of the book is that part that's elaborated on. That's Nick's researching really to add to that. So. So a 30-hour flight, um, special torches with extra batteries, polystyrene cases for the bottles, and a big roll of American dollars. And you walk into this vineyard. What were your first impressions? Well, first of all, the first day we were there, we couldn't get out the wine because we had this talk fest between George and an English of the executives wanting to tell us how fantastic the place was, and us sitting there going, <laughs> Etc. Anyway, um, but when we actually got into the cellar, um, we'd seen photographs, uh, so we had a fair idea what to expect. But yeah, when we walked in, um, it was like an orchestra, I guess. You walk in, it was they turn on the lights, and the, the lights were dull, of course. The cellar was very wet, um, like dripping part of it, um, which was very good for the corks because it'll mean they retain moisture and they work better. But of course, a lot of labels were missing from the bottles or partly missing. But, um, and it just went uh, racks and racks just off into the gloom of bottles, some covered with cobwebs. Um, but it had a, a smell and a sense of this had been here for a long time. And so um, where do you start in a cellar <laughs> as big and potentially as valuable as that? Well, you start with your list and, what, and virtually start with your most valuable wines and work your way back. So um, we uh, started, well, to start we had to work out where the wines were. And the do, they, do they do them by alphabet or by no, year? No, Did no, you go to the Y section or? It's not as simple, I wish it was as simple as that. <laughs> it wasn't. But in their cellar book, um, they had the names of the wines, which of course we couldn't read. Um, and, but they had shelf number one to 27 or something, I can't remember what number was. Um, and Kevin, my accomplice, and Poitro, who is one of the Georgians who spoke quite good English, they, they sort of worked out how the cellar book worked. Um, the cellar master, Revez, his cellar master, explained to them how it worked and how you'd find that wine on which shelf. Like we had, okay, shelf 23, but they had ways of marking on the shelf where the wines were. And after about an hour or two, Kevin and Patro worked this out, and I was standing there with the English list, and I'd say, okay, um, shelf number three, uh, do you have uh, a chem? And, they, and Patro would look down the list and say, I've got a chem, uh, 1921, I've got a chem, 1858, and I'd sort of say, okay, how many bottles of 1858 have you got? And he'd say, seven, and I'd look at my list, 1858, seven. I'd say, okay, could, we, could you get them out? So they get the seven bottles out, and we inspect them for various ways, put our fluoro lights behind them so you can see the fill level of the bottle, because in old wines it's quite important how full the bottle is. Um, the f obviously the fuller the better. And we had a big bright light behind it so we could take photographs of them. And then we put those back and then I'd say, okay, can we go to shelf uh, 14? Um, have you got a wine there, Margot? which is one of the great Chateau Margot. <clears throat> and Poitro would go down the list with Kevin, he'd sort of say, oh yes, down the bottom here I've got Margot 1884. And I go, you know, how many bottles do you have? He'd say, we've got nine. I'd go, I've got nine on my list. <laughs> so it was marrying up extraordinarily. And they'd get them out and we'd inspect them again. So we just did that for hours and hours and hours, um, very much concentrating <clears throat> on Chateau Akem because it was uh, the wine. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's... <coughs> how many bottles do you reckon were in the cellar and how much do you think the total cellar would have been worth? Well, we... Yeah, we... I think there's approximately 40,000 bottles, including old Georgian wine. And old Georgian wine's quite valuable and, and quite a rarity in the wine world because Georgia's considered the cradle of wine. Uh, it's between Georgia and Mesopotamia is where uh, wine making first started, but generally considered Georgia. So anything uh, antiquated in wine in Georgia has got this sort of 
see mystical buzz about it. So we, we, think, we believe there's about 40,000 bottles. And how much do you reckon that would be worth? We valued about seven or eight million dollars. Now, there's a great deal of story, you know, uh, myths around um, Ikem, around Margot, around Lafitte. But how did all this incredible wine end up in a Georgian cellar? Okay, <clears throat> the story we got, and it does marry up, because, you know, we're, we're looking for holes in the story, holes in the wine, holes in anything, you know. We, you know, this could have been a big fraud. Um, so the story we were told that this was the, the wines of the last Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, <clears throat> and actually some from his father, I think it was Alexander III. And then when, in the Russian Revolution, when Nicholas was <clears throat> taken outside and removed, um, it became state property, of course. So Lenin was in charge and then, and then, of course, Stalin. And Stalin was concerned that Hitler was going to overrun Russia in the Second World War. And so he divided this cellar up, and I can't imagine what he did with other artefacts, but anyway. Um, and he sent a section to the Masandra Winery in the Crimea, which is the na Russia's national winery. And he sent one third, we we're told anyway, to his hometown of Tbilisi, where it could be secreted away and no one would be any the wiser. And no one was any the wiser. So it sat there for 50, you know, 50 years, 60 years, 55 years before this, hap this episode happened. And what brought on the possibility of us seeing it was the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, and the, and the dissolving of the Soviet Union. Because if that hadn't have happened, it would probably be still sitting there. Now, don't forget, if you're watching on Facebook Live, to post your questions in the comments, and I'll read them out in a little while. But tell me, John, you know, you did meet some very interesting, frustrating, mysterious, and possibly even quite dangerous characters on your adventure. Have any of them read the book, and what have their reactions been? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't actually sent anyone a book. <laughs> but actually, I wouldn't know how to contact them, you know, so... Um, I mean, it might get to them. There's a bit of chitter-chat in Europe already about the book, um, on wine talk sites and things like that, so who knows where it's going to go, but no, they don't know. They I mean, the book's only just come out and they're a long way away. <laughs> now, for many of us, um, wine can seem not just mysterious, but kind of perplexing. You know, for me, it, I don't know if it's the same for you, but wine can feel like a bit of a lucky dip when I go into the bottle -o. What advice do you have for any aspiring mm. quaffers, apart from not holding it by the neck? Yeah, <laughs> that's another story. But anyway, um, on a... The advice I give anyone now is uh, find a good wine merchant and just take their advice. Because I mean, I go, I haven't run a wine store now for 10 years. I go in a wine shop now, <laughs> I'm just confused with the labels and the, I mean, I, wouldn't, I couldn't run a wine shop now, I don't think, I just don't, don't even know half the products. Um, so I think the best advice is find yourself a good wine merchant, let him make a living, which means he's going to make a, a small profit out of what he, they sell you and you'll get some good wines if you get a good wine merchant. With all respect to our friends at Dan Murphy's and some of the discounters, um, I don't think you'll get that advice there, but it's up to you. Or you can just take pot luck. But I mean, pot luck could be disappointing. You met some interesting people, you drank some amazing wines, and you had some exciting adventures with some great stories to tell. So why did you get out of a wine purveying? Oh, I don't know. I think, um, you know, it's small business. You work hard. Um, the, the busier you are, the harder you work. Doesn't matter how good your staff is. You know, I found I was spending a lot of Saturday and Sunday just doing administration. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Time to move on, I suppose. Now, Ernest Hemingway once said famously that you should write drunk and edit hungover. What's, <laughs> what's your hangover tip for those of us who might still be looking for a hangover cure, John? I don't, honestly, I don't have one. And one of my problems is I, I've got a fairly low tolerance of alcohol. So I, um, wine and alcohol really does affect me. Um, so I don't know what the trick is, but 
except that when I was running Bordeaux Shippers, which is a business I had importing wines from Bordeaux with the Chem and Lafitte and all these wines, is I used to always just about always spit out. I very rarely swallowed. And some of the big tastings I'd go to, we might taste 110, 115 wines in a day, and I'd be spitting them, always spitting them occasionally. I'd have a little swallow of occasionally, <laughs> <when they're> like, <coughs> particularly something. Um, and of course, tasting that many, your palate does become jaded. But um, you certainly feel a lot better for it. And I actually had some friends come to Bordeaux one time when this big tasting happens on a, a Saturday by the Union de Grand Cru put to Bordeaux and they were consumers. And I said, now, make sure you spit out because, you know, this, there's a lot of wine. There's something like 200 chateaus. They've each got a back vintage of something. And at lunch, you've got all these back vintages of wines on tables just to go and help yourself. So I said to them, you've got to spit out. Otherwise, you know, you'll be gone. And of course, you know, they're having the time of their lives. And they're back in bed by lunchtime. So <laughs> think virtually, you know, they were just they were wiped out. Interestingly enough, I was once commissioned to write a book about coffee, and nobody told me to spit the coffee out. Mm. So the next day, I was still out of bed. <laughs> yeah, I didn't knock you out. Now we often talk about wine pairings with food. But what drop would you recommend to go with reading Stalin's Wine Cellar, John? <laughs> well, well, you can't really have the wines in the book. I mean, obviously, <laughs> well, you can. Um, a current vintage of a chem is $1,000, um, which, you know, to some people's not uh, ridiculous, but it's expensive. Um, I don't really know. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. You know, you can have a, 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 certainly a sweet wine if you want to get the, the flavour of where you are. And I think on the three wines that were recommended by the wine shop, they've got uh, uh, Calme de Riesec, which is, that's the second wine of Chateau Riesec. Ries, Chateau Riesec is next to Chateau Achem. It's, it's a lovely Sauterne. It's certainly not in the class of Achem, but it's also not in the price. Um, so you, if, you, if you like sweet wine, you can certainly sip away at that and while well, you're sort of flying into Tbilisi and <laughs> dealing with gunmen. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, if you buy a copy <clears throat> of Stalin's Wine Cellar online or on the Facebook Live page or in store at Roaring Stories in Balmain, you will go into the running for a wonderful hamper, including that brilliant Sauterne and some great Georgian wines to help bring you back to Stalin's Wine Cellar. Of course, without the roll of money in your pocket and gun-toting Georgians standing around you. So why don't we go to some questions from you? Anyone got any questions for John? And if you're on Facebook Live, why don't you post your questions on the comments page and I'll read them out for you. You said uh, it was one third of the cellar that went to Tbilisi and one third went to the Crimea and maybe another third went somewhere else. If this is answered in the book, don't tell me, I'll oh, no. read it. What happened to the other two thirds, do you know? So I'll just ask that question for everyone on Facebook Live. One third went to Tbilisi, one third went to the Crimea, one third went to... We don't know, I, could, I would assume it probably stayed in St Petersburg. So I, what I happened guess. to the other two thirds? I don't know. I don't know. I'll still get the book. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Really, we don't know. This is the mystical parts of the book, of the story. That, um, and, you know, we were only concerned with the third that we were negotiating on and maybe if we... Yeah, so, yeah, what happened to the rest, we don't know, and... It's two more possible books, then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> so, John, when you, when you went to Ikem with your spilt Ikem in Furia bottles or whatever, so how did they react? Did they immediately go, yes, this is, this is it? Um, and, and also, how, how rare would that wine be now? Like, how many sort of... Yeah, um, they reacted in a mixed manner, shall we say. <laughs> they did see the humour of, of the situation. Well, first of all, I think they're a little bit shocked because we made a disappointment and, and Pierre Le Tom was there and said that he was the CEO of a chem and Sandra Gavet and um, when I pulled out my little Perry bottles and put, <laughs> put them on the table. And I thought I'm going to be the first Australian to be thrown out of Shadow of Kem for sure. <laughs> I might not have been the first, but anyway, I was going to get thrown. Anyway, so, but I didn't know Pierre Le Tom because we'd done business before. 
And um, we told them the story and they sort of looked at each other and, and then they saw the humour of it because I explained it, you know, we didn't mean to break it and all the rest of that sort of thing. Um, but they were still, um, but they were very interested. I think this was about three days after we'd broken it. Um, so they still tested it and Sandra and Gabay look, had a look, good look at the bottle and the cork and the capsule and she pulled the capsule off very carefully so she could spread it out and have a good look at it and had a look at the glass and everything and she and Pierre Leton had a conversation uh, in French and uh, they had an assistant there and so a bit of muttering was going on and then they, we tasted the wine. And um, I remember Sandrine said to me, she said, what did it taste like three days ago? And I said, oh, it was, it was a bit brighter, a little bit fresher and today it's maybe a touch more cloying, a little bit more caramelly, uh, but it was, yeah, and, but it was much the same wine. And she had a good taste and smell and Pierre Leton did and her assistant and da 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 conversation. She came back and said, well, this is a chem. This is, this is definitely Chateau Chem. We went, yes! Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's all we wanted to know and having broken, I thought I lost my opportunity to, to find out if it was authentic or if it was a genuine article. Um, so, yeah, I'd in my best um, French chateau visiting way, I went, that's good. <laughs> anyway. Why do you think a chem is so special? Is it because of the process? Is it because of the myth or the reputation? Or is it because of the taste? Uh, it's like um, pretty well, all, I think, all good wines, probably most things in life. It, it is intrinsic qualities, no question. You can't market an ordinary product at a highish price and get away with it for very long. So in the end, you can line the chem up with other Saturns and it will just about always come out on top or it'll, you know, it stands out of some Why? Because it's got, a, it's got an intensity, a depth of character, it's got a, a richness and a sweetness to it that is beyond most Saturns, yet it's still got this tingling acidity, it's got vibrancy, um, all the things that a great wine should have. And also, it's called a chem. So it's got this incredible history. Uh, there's, I think in the book we, we talk about the 1847 a chem is the most expensive white wine ever sold in the world. I think um, at the moment it's about $200,000 a bottle if you can find one, if it's genuine, if it's come from a good seller, if a, if a lot of things actually. But there's a story we've quoted in the book where I think it was, um, uh, um, Alexander the Third, or anyway, one of the czars of Russia was having a lunch with one of the America presidents and Wilhelm from Austria or Germany, where he was from, and they drank 47 a can. So that, for a start, just puts it up in, <laughs> in lights, sort of thing. So there's, so when a wine carries that sort of esteem, um, when some of the people who money doesn't matter want to want to have a wine that's exceptional, they'll go, well, what's the best? You know, where do we park our Rolls Royces? <laughs> sort of thing, you know? Um, and they'll try to get a 47 or one of those sort of wines, if they can. But you've had those dinners where you and your fellow enophiles will sit around and guess the terroir, the vintage, the region, all that sort of stuff mm. to be able to determine which, where this wine is from, or what wine it might be, right down to the I presume the name of the lady who picked the berry <laughs> and what her star sign is. Yeah, star sign. <laughs> but for most, well, for me at least, I mean, I've got a, when my father-in-law, for example, comes over to our place and says, guess how much I paid for this bottle of wine? And I say 10 bucks, it's <laughs> never quite that much. <laughs> He went to Aldi and got it for five dollars. Anyway, yes, he did. <laughs> and yet, I, while I can tell the difference between a two-dollar bottle of wine and a ten-dollar bottle of wine, it's very difficult for me to be able to tell the difference between a ten-dollar bottle of wine and a two hundred-dollar bottle of wine. Hmm. What is that distinction, and how can we, I guess, discern it? Does it mean drinking a lot of expensive wine? And once you've drunk all that expensive wine, how do you go back to your ten dollar wine? <laughs> it's like being upgraded to business class and then having going to on the return journey back on economy. Yeah, that, that, the going back is the difficult part. <laughs> um, 
No, um, one is how interested are you? You know, um, do you really want to know about two hundred dollar wine or that level, or you know, or do you depends who's paying, John? Well, that's right. But no, you said, I mean, I know when I've had certainly staff and other people, it's really a function of how many glasses you put your nose in and try. It's 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 mileage. How, how many? How interested are you? How much wine have you tried? If you're keeping the company of people who are interested in more than just quaffing, then there's often a conversation that goes on. But there are some. Um, like I, we do this sometimes, and when you're probably referring to, in the book, we talk about this options game where you bring a bottle of wine along and you pour it round and you've got five questions and everyone's got to answer the questions and basically you identify the wine. The first question is often is this you know, southern hemisphere or northern hemisphere? And, something, and some of those questions are quite easy or even if is a wine French or is it Italian? And I said if someone just put your nose into the glass and take a really big smell because your, your senses are in your nose, not on your palate. Your nose is what t gives you your information. So take a really big smell and tell me what country you think of. And 60, 70 percent of the time, people get it right. They go, smells like Italy. It is Italy. What does Italy smell like? Um, OK, no. I don't know, but the, the, the classic characteristic of Italian red wine is sour cherry. It just is. So many Italian wines have just got this slightly sour cherry sort of character. And at French wines are often got an earthy, sous bois, what they call this forest floor earthiness. If you get that in, in a wine, pretty good chance it's French. It just it happened to be. And what does Georgian wine smell like, John? <laughs> I don't really know much. We, um, yeah, um, the only ones I really tasted, actually you know, the ones I tasted when we were there, we tasted some very old ones, 1940, 1930, etc. But one thing that really amazed me, even when we are tasting these old wines, some of them weren't really wines anymore, but, but they weren't finished, you know, they weren't oxidised. And they had this slightly candy sort of character about them. And I remember I actually took some notes and I'd sort of say, you know, greenish like tea or something, and it's, but it's got this... Anyway, we were in a restaurant one time with the Georgians and they ordered, they ordered the best bottle of wine from Georgia. It was a red wine. I thought, oh, this will be interesting. But, you know, current release or three or four years old. They poured it round, I tasted it and I went, it's sweet. They sugar their wines. That's what they do. So they add a certain amount of sugar in their winemaking process, or they did then, and that's why these very old, and sugar's a preservative. So these very old wines that just tasted like wine, but but they weren't oxidised like vinegar, and they had this slightly candy sort of character to them. It was the sugar they put in the wine. So, Aaron asks, what's Georgian wine culture like? Well, we know we've got the French, you know, yeah, sure. and the Italian. I'm surprised, you know, when you go to Italy that people don't actually drink very much when you're at the table. Mm. <laughs> don't know what table you're I'm at. I'm hanging out. <laughs> I'm sitting at the wrong no, table. No, no. Anyway, whatever. what's um, Georgian wine culture well, like? Well, Georgian, as I said, I think I said before, Georgia claims to be the oldest winemaking civilization in the world of 8,000 years, um, and a lot of that's um, been resurrected. And there's some, um, there's an importer here. I think he's one of the wines <clears throat> on that uh, box is his uh, Pheasant's Tears, I think it's called. And these are wines that are made in what we call a slightly oxidative way. Instead of protecting the, the wine to be pure, they almost let it oxidise slightly and they put it in clay um, uh, containers and buried in the ground. So they've got all these sort of techniques that others haven't used. And a lot of, or not a lot, some Australian winemakers are using these techniques now because they provide a wine that's different, interesting, not necessarily that great, but some are, some are, inter some are good, some are interesting. Like all wine. So. You're selling that hamper well, aren't you, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I've always been fascinated by Georgian wine culture. Um, we'll get into that in a sec, but we've got a question from Claire. She said, What's the difference on Facebook Live? What's the difference, do you think, in dealing with um, drunk rockers and <laughs> wine making Georgians? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Not drunk musicians or drunk crowd. Either or. Ah, drunk musicians are difficult. <laughs> drunk crowd, this is the 80s. Throw them out. <laughs> it's quite simple. Um, yeah, that was, I mean, that, 
it was interesting that 80s rock and roll, it was the Wild West, really. You know, we'd at our hotel at, at uh, quarter to six, our lounge would be empty, and at, if Cold Chisel or someone like that were playing, at quarter past six, there'd be 2,000 kids in there going off, going completely ballistic. And um, it was fantastic. <laughs> but it was, and you know, but nothing really happened much. I mean, people, some people got a bit drunk, some people got thrown out, and no one got, no one got hurt, everybody got home. <laughs> um, but uh, dealing with uh, the other one with George and... Winemakers. Winemakers. Uh, well, depends if they're carrying guns or not, because when we were there, a lot of these Georgians were carrying guns. And it was interesting that the first morning when we um, were picked up at the hotel, they'd come to the hotel and there's a metal detector at the door and they just hand their guns over onto a counter and walk in and collect us and on the way out they get given their gun back like it was an umbrella. You know, it's no big deal, no fuss. Why, were, why did they have guns? Was it that lawless <laughs> in Georgia? This was, this was uh, five or six years after uh, the country became... No, the gun, uh, guns and cash were the rule of law pretty well. That's how they did things. You know, you sit at a table for having lunch and as people today might put their mobile phone, they just put their gun on the table. You know, as I mentioned, I'm very <coughs> fascinated with Georgian culture. I know that Stalin often kept Khrushchev and members of the Politburo up for hours into the night, terrified as he asked them to, or ordered them, to make elaborate Georgian toasts. The Georgian Toastmaster is known as a tomato? Tomato. Or tomato. tomato. Let's call the whole thing <coughs> off. No, let's not. Now, John, you've experienced Georgian wine culture more than <laughs> I have. We've got two glasses of wine. I'll get you to give them a little bit of a sniff and tell me what country they're from. <laughs> no, it doesn't, doesn't have the sugary, sugariness of a Georgian wine. But I bet it is Georgian. <laughs> Who can say? Yeah, Who can say. say? It's a blind test. Now, would you like to give us a little tomato tomato? Okay. Um, George, um, who was our uh, contact there in Georgia, was a jovial, jolly fellow and very good guy. So often at dinner, George would onto his feet and go, I'm the tomato. No, I'm that. No, he wouldn't have the tomatoes. He'd... Anyway, whatever. And he, and he was a toast. It was toast to everyone and anything. So George would get up and go, you know, I toast the Royal Oak. I toast Roaring Stories. I toast Sunil. I toast you people. I toast Australia. I toast Georgia. I toast anything you can think of. I toast the business we're going to do. So I toast tonight and thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much for an intoxicating, such an intoxicating <laughs> conversation uh, there, John. And uh, John will be available afterwards for a chat um, to sign Stalin's Wine Cellar, which is published by Penguin Random House. A chat and possibly a toast outside mm -hmm. at the desk where you can buy a copy for yourself and for Dad oh, because yeah. remember that it's Father's Day this Sunday and if you buy a copy, either Roaring Stories in the store, on Facebook Live or on the Roaring Stories website at roaringstories.com.au, you will go into the running for a hamper of three amazing wines valued at $150 from our friends at Field and Wine, uh, sorry, Field Blend Wine and Cheese Store, including a 2017 Pheasants Tears Ricketsiel. Well done. <laughs> Apologies to any Georgians watching tonight. <laughs> a 2018 Makaridze Winery Alla Dasturi. And apologies to my high school French teacher, Mrs. Newman. Pardon, madame. A 2015 Carme de Rousseck Sauterne. Very, very close to Chateau de Kiem, at least in terms of location. Remember to be in the running to win you have to buy a copy of the book, which will be signed by John, either online, on Facebook Live, or in the store. And if you live in Balmain or surrounding suburbs, the postage will be free. Remember, you can pop in store, um, you can come into Roaring Stories, make sure you do check us out at roaringstories.com.au. Sign up for the um, newsletter where you'll get lots of news about events, new releases, exclusive discounts, 
and some interesting tidbits like interviews with your favourite authors and specially curated Spotify playlists to accompany your wine, if you win the hamper, <laughs> while you read Stalin's Wine Cellar. I'm Snell Badami and I hope we'll see you again at another Roaring Stories online author event or in the store. Next week we'll be reading The Book of Summer, a great summer read, Bluebird, by the renowned literary critic, sports journalist and author Malcolm Knox. And I hope to see you there on Facebook Live or else in the store any time before Father's Day. Hey, eh? Thanks a lot. Thank you. <clears throat>